are lucky enough today to be spending 22 minutes with Jewel. How wonderful to have you here. Thank you for having me. I want to talk about your movie, but you are one of those singers in that rarefied air. You just have the one name. <laughs> was, that, was, that, was that a choice, or was it always going to be Jewel, and you knew you were going to drop the last name? I didn't mean to. Um, I was surfing in San Diego when I was FedExed, you know, back in the days before there was digital everything, um, <laughs> some different album mock-ups, and I was like, the waves were so good. I was like, just pick whatever one you guys like, which is very rare for me. I'm usually very super detail-oriented, and I uh, ended up being just Jewel, and when it happened, I was like, just, I mean, there's nothing Barbie? Like, <laughs> real people aren't called one name? What are you talking about? <laughs> and I didn't think the record would do that well, and I was like, oh, if I don't like it, I'll change it to Jewel Kilcher, but... Ended up doing well, so yeah. I was stuck with it. And and the rest, as and they say, I is am. history, yeah. right? <laughs> Let's talk about this. Is the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries Channel, mm -hmm. and uh, the name of, of the movie, which I, I got to watch, Concrete Evidence of Fixer Upper mm -hmm. Mystery. Mm -hmm. And when I heard about it, I said, "Wow, that's great!" Like everybody loves to see a home that's going to be restored, and everybody loves a good mystery. <laughs> so this is sort of a melding of the two. Tell us about the story. I'm a big sleuthing fan. I grew up really loving watching Angela Lansbury and Murder, She Wrote, sort of my binge-watching go-to like between tours and things like that. Um, so it was really fun for me getting to play a character who's a modern woman. She, you know, fixes up houses. She's a contractor in a male-dominated world, which is something I relate to as a musician. You're often in a very male-dominated world. Sure. And where I grew up in Alaska is very male-dominated. I grew up without a mom. My dad raised me, all brothers. And so I was raised fixing fences and working cattle and training horses and doing as much outdoor work as indoor work. Um, and so I love that this character had that, but she's still very feminine. And her superpower, in my mind, isn't just her eye for detail, which makes her a great contractor, but she's learned to follow her gut and really fight for her intuition, which I think as humans and as women, that's really our struggle, is to get out of your head and really get into your gut and go, what do I know is right? And to right. be relentless in following that. True. And your character, Shannon, she has to go back to the old high school mm -hmm. for this, which is another thing I think, you know, everybody can relate yeah. to. Like, what is it like walking the halls of your high school again? Yeah. It's a weird thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this takes place, it kind of solves a cold crime, if you will, that happened back when my character was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so you have some of those watching the characters, you know, however X many years later and where they are now. Right. And a uh, lot, lot of red herrings, a lot of twists. It, ke it keeps you going through the whole, the whole hour and a half. Like, what is going to happen? here. So now is this the start? Are you going to be in all of the different uh, installations of this particular series for the Hallmark Murders and Mysteries? Yeah, the Hallmark Movie and Mysteries is its own separate network. It's the, one of the fastest growing networks um, actually across all cable I believe right now. And I think it's because of the mystery element. It really engages the audience because yeah. everybody loves, you know, just like me watching Angela Lansbury at home, you know, everybody loves to see if they can solve it and figure out what's happening. Right. And so hopefully we're writing good stories that people will enjoy. And there'll be a total of nine of them if they continue to do well. Oh, that's so great. I'm in it. That's great. And uh, the first one had, had big numbers. Yeah. Is that something that you look at that you have to concern yourself with or do you just go, you yeah, know, you learn your lines and you do your your thing and, and well, and executive produce, I should mention. Um, is that a concern? Is it... Uh... I mean, you hope anything you do works and connects, you know, right. but I try and take projects that I'm creatively interested in because you can't control the outcome of everything. Not everything's a winner. And so right. I know I get to go home at the end of every night saying I did something that pushed my limits, that made me learn something creatively or as a human. And I felt that way about this role. Um, so to have it also succeed and also have big numbers is also incredibly rewarding. Right. To know that you're making something people are enjoying watching at home. Sure. Now for me watching at home, I'm watching I'm saying, well, she, she looks really comfortable. Oh good. Um, and it, do you think that that is because you're a performer, you're a singer, you're used to performing for everything from arenas to intimate uh, settings as a singer. Do you think that that makes the acting job easier? I think being an emotional singer helps me be comfortable with emotions. Mm -hmm. And what I like about acting that singing and writing songs doesn't allow me to do is really get at the subconscious. Mm -hmm. People very rarely say what they intend or what they need or what they mean. Often what we say is the opposite of what our actual real wish is. And that gets a lot into human psychology, which has always fascinated me since I was a young child watching people. It's why I've written short stories a lot in my life, because mm -hmm. um, those underpinnings interest me. And acting really is about that. It has very little to do with what you're saying and a lot more to do with your body language. And 
what you're noticing, but try not to give away that you notice it and those types of things. So mm -hmm. it gives you a lot more intellectually and creatively to play with. The more difficult thing about acting is I'm used to a live medium, which you and I were talking mm -hmm. just before we started filming. Right. You know, I'm used to being live and there's a certain amount of danger and I like that. When you're live, you, you force a certain type of energy up out of yourself. A little bit and of adrenaline, right? It's yeah. a little bit of yeah. adrenaline. Yeah. And when you're filming, I have to remind myself, especially over an 18-hour day, like, this is still happening. This is still important. Right. Even though it's just a still camera and a guy behind a camera, right. you have to imagine there's an audience there watching sure. you and keep delivering that intensity over a longer period of time. Uh, so those types of things are different, learning how to have your body portray emotion without a melody mm -hmm. you know things like that were mm -hmm. they're, they're new learning steps for me and you hold such a high bar for yourself or i do you know if you're really good at one craft you want a new craft to try and be creeping every day toward a higher bar sure. and so i keep trying to push myself and i think i'm better in this film than i was the last one and hopefully that will continue that's right it wasn't wasn't your first job your first foray into acting. You had the movie with Tobey Maguire, right? Uh -huh. Didn't you play June Carter, too? Yeah, I got an Ang Lee film as my first film, which was incredible in my 20s. Um, but when I realized what it it's would take to have two full-time yeah. jobs, I didn't think I could do it and have a personal life. Right. And my goal when I got signed, it was discovered when I was homeless, and I was like, why would I sign? You know, you'd think a homeless kid would just jump at the chance. But fame actually scared me. I know I didn't want to be famous, and I wasn't doing it for the money. I wanted the opportunity to do something that I loved and make a living at it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a really a gift very few people are given. I felt very fortunate for that. So I knew I wanted to be an artist. I cared more about artistry and the chance to live a passion than I did about fame and, and fortune. Right. And that helped me make decisions and kind of be a compass for me day to day on a career level. But on a human level, I knew my number one job was to overcome my background and my programming and a lot of the trauma that I had been through and become a good person and a right. whole person that didn't become more neurotic and more insecure as fame or as a career might take off. Right. And that's why I've done the career I have done, where I take years between records. I do a lot of very unorthodox things and I mm -hmm. switch genres and things that you're not technically supposed to do, yeah. but I did it to put an investment in myself as a human to make sure I was growing emotionally and creatively and as a parent and as my as it as a partner, you know, to be able to have intimacy in my life and right. you know, to have happiness, you have to have harmony in every area and you can't have it if you just focus on a career and just have a really buff career arm. So yeah. I gave up acting <laughs> really early in my career. And now it's kind of just come back around with being able to do the Lifetime movie where I played June Carter Cash. It was a month. I got to do it with my son with me. Um, and these Can't Hallmark beat that movies, for a gig, right? No, it's awesome. And these <laughs> Hallmark movies film in three months, or sorry, three weeks. My yeah. son comes with me, and you're back home. You know, so it's a really great thing creatively and as a mom. So it really fits my yeah. value system. That's great. Um, you you made references to your, your growing up and for people who don't know the Jewel story, I mean you've certainly been open about it, you've written memoirs and mm -hmm. poetry and albums. Um, people who don't know it, you went from leaving leaving your house when, when you were 15 and being this just girl on the road and singing and mm -hmm. singing with your dad, right, in honky tonks when you were a little girl mm -hmm. to then traveling and, and Finally, and I, I have to bring this story up because we are a radio station. Mm -hmm. um, it was a radio DJ, right, who got mm -hmm. a bootleg copy of one of your songs. Yeah. Was that? Tell us that story. Yeah, so I grew up in Alaska. My family were pioneers. They helped settle the state um, when it was a territory still. Mm -hmm. And so I was. My mom left when I was eight, and I took over her place in the family show. So I started singing in bars when I was eight. I was probably the only fourth grader that went from elementary school right to the bar. <laughs> and it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how people handle pain. And it was one of the reasons I decided never to drink or do drugs was because I realized you can't outrun pain. And that my most capable alarm system for keeping myself safe when I, my dad became an alcoholic and abusive and I was in these pretty unsafe environments um, getting to sing, which I loved, but I had to look after myself. and. Having your wits about you is very important. And so if you numb one emotion, you end up numbing them all. And so I learned at a young age to embrace emotions instead of run away from emotions. Mm -hmm. That ended up being a life-changing decision and ended up being a career path, which I didn't think it would end up right, being. It's right. not why I did it. But because of my dad's relationship and him being abusive, I left when I was 15. And so paying rent and hitchhiking to work, it was a lot of stress. But I knew I wanted to learn a new emotional language, learn a new emotional English, if you will, so that I didn't repeat the cycle that I was raised by. 
And I did pretty good for several years, um, but fast forward, you know, three years, and I'm homeless. Um, when a boss propositioned me and I wouldn't have sex with him, he wouldn't give me my paycheck, I couldn't pay my rent. I moved into my car thinking it would only last a couple of months, and then my car got stolen. And so that's how I ended up homeless. And this, the poverty cycle is very difficult to get out of. I was having incredible panic attacks. I was agoraphobic, and I was shoplifting. And I caught a vision of myself in the mirror one day trying to steal a dress, and I was like, I'm a statistic. I didn't beat the odds. I'm doing what I was programmed to do. I'm a slave to my neurology. How can I make my brain work for me and not against me? And I started developing exercises the first of which was watching my hands, actually. I remember a quote by Boda, Buddha that said, happiness doesn't depend on who you are or what you have. It depends on what you think. And it's all I had left, so I had nothing to lose but to see if that was true. And I couldn't even get a grip on my thoughts because I had so much anxiety. Um, and so I started watching my hands because they're the servants of your thought. If you want to know what you're thinking, watch what your hands are doing because they're your thoughts slowed down into action. And that became a song I wrote called Hands that ended up becoming a hit years later. Um, but a lot of my first songs were really about me learning to be mindful, me learning to curate my thoughts more carefully than I curated what I ate, what I wore. It was more important than any other thing. And to look at the quote by uh, Descartes that said, I think, therefore I am. And I tweaked it slightly to say, I perceive what I think, therefore I am. So if I could perceive I was afraid, that means I was something other than afraid. I was the observer of afraid. Mm -hmm. So who's the observer? That's like the driver of the car. Our brain is the steering wheel. It isn't the driver. But for a lot of us that don't have a good mindfulness practice or an ability to have a self-awareness in real time, our brain is on autopilot. It takes over the machine, and we just react. And we repeat habits that we're not happy of, with, we're not proud of. We repeat cycles that were negative. They're very self-defeating. We get very frustrated, and the cycle mm -hmm. continues. So these exercises helped me really break those patterns and learn new patterns. Um, and that's what a lot of my songwriting was about. And yeah, I was discovered by a DJ who came into the coffee shop. I built up a large following after singing these incredibly vulnerable and emotional songs. Um, and he put a bootleg on the air and radio. Uh, it got so requested on the radio that record labels started coming down and seeing me. And then they, there was a bidding war. Yeah. And then you signed with Atlantic, uh -huh. right? Big label. Yeah. And you come up with this album. Now, when, when you recorded that, that album that went on to sell, I, I forget the exact like numbers, like 12 million, times yeah. platinum or mm -hmm. something, um, was it easy? Was it easy that the songs just, just fall out of you? You know, I guess I've heard it say that a lot of times uh, people write their best songs when they're, when they're younger, and yet you see, like, novelists being older. I don't mm -hmm. know, I, was it easy being, being this young woman? It was, you, you weren't even 21 yet, right, when you wrote that album? Um, I wrote the record between the ages of 16 and 18. Yeah. Um, Who'll Save Your Soul is the first song I ever wrote. It became my first single, which is very surreal. Things like that don't happen. Was that easy to write? Did um, it just... I wrote it for the fun and the adventure of writing, um, what I was seeing around me, and I grew up reading great writing. I loved, you know, everything from the Greek classics um, to, you know, the great American writers to the great Russian writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sang my whole life and I written poetry my whole life. And so marrying the two was just sort of a real natural thing for me, not because I thought I would make a career of it, but just because it was a fun adventure and I enjoyed doing it. Right. When I got signed, I was surprised because grunge was all the rage and I was the opposite of grunge. Um, I don't think any true cynic is alive. I think they all kill themselves. And anybody that's alive and a cynic is an optimistic person and hiding the fact that they have hope because they're too afraid to go after their, their dreams. Um, and so I don't have, you know, when you're pushed with your back up against the wall, you say, I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to figure something out. And that's where I had come to in my life. I was like, I'm going to figure something out. I'm not going to die. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to make my life my best work of art. And so when I signed my record deal, that's the mind frame that I was in. And I looked where pop culture was with grunge, and I was like, oh, I'm never going to make it, <laughs> you know, pop culture. Yeah. So I turned down a million dollar signing bonus um, because I'd read a book on how the record label systems were structured, how record deals were structured, that it was a big loan. And if you didn't pay that signing bonus back through record sales rather quickly, you would get dropped. And I didn't want to get dropped. Right. I knew I was going to make a folk record at the height of grunge and that that was a long shot. And so I tried to de-risk myself for the label where I took a big back end where basically if I sold records, I would make money because I earned it. Right. And I went about going the old fashioned way. You know, I turned down 
big reality shows like, uh, what was it, Big Brother or something like that? It was a big reality show at the mm -hmm. time. I turned it down. My label was very shocked, but I didn't want to break with any shortcuts. I wanted to do right. grassroots and tour and earn it. Did they try to change you? Did they say, hey, you know, it, oh, listen, you'll sell even more records if you're, if you're a, a TV star and this and that and change your music and maybe do, may, do it a little more pop. That did. Did the uh, the machine, <laughs> did they, they try to change you? Because I had a bidding war over me, I was able to really get nitty gritty with a lot of the heads of the labels and really kind of figure out and use my gut to figure out mm -hmm. whether I believed they were sincere about letting me be a singer-songwriter. And the reason I chose Atlantic is because I thought they were sincere and they mm -hmm. structured the deal in a way that meant if I won, you know, I could make the record I wanted. They didn't push any type of pop producer on me. They didn't try and change who I was. I had the freedom to choose a producer. There wasn't an A&R person in the studio with me. I made the record I wanted to make, you and did. it was a very honest, very authentic record. And they let me do that my whole career. I never had the experience of like, hey, wear this. Or when I went pop, they didn't even question it. You yeah. know, and that was a really risky move. Nobody who was like credible singer-songwriter made pop records. It was just unheard of and a huge risk. And they were just, they were there with me. They really believed in right. my talent and let me follow my instincts. I heard that you had, you got some good advice from the likes of Neil Young and Bob mm -hmm. Dylan on to essentially, I mean, I'm paraphrasing wildly here, but to stay true to yourself. Yeah. Is that the kind of advice you got, you got from them? Yeah, my first record was done at Neil Young's Ranch with um, his band and one of his producers, Ben Keith. Um, and they were the old school troubadour type of musicians. I was very unsure of myself. I've always been incredibly, you know, hubris is the antithesis of, of creativity. And so I've never believed in arrogance. I always think I have something to learn. Mm -hmm. And in the studio as such a young kid with people that have played with Bob Dylan and Neil Young and James Brown, you know, my default is to go, what do you guys think? Do you guys like it? I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. And they just forced me to go, do you like it? Right. We won't tell you, do you like it? Are you happy? And it just forced me. I mean, it was agonizing, frankly, but they really forced me mm -hmm. to get in touch with, yeah, I believe this is honest, and I believe this represents who I am now. And the record was a fantastic failure. It didn't sell a copy for about 12 months, over 12 months. The label tried, we tried. I did 600 shows a year, 700, 800 shows a year. Oh I did three and four cities a day. I really was grinding it out and we were getting nowhere because grunge was king. Right. And that's when um, Bob Dylan took me on the road and he believed in what I did and he was like, don't quit, just keep doing it. And I was touring solo acoustic with punk bands and you know, it was just a difficult time to break. And Having Bob Dylan believe in you, even if nobody else ever does, you're like, okay, I'm going to stick with it. And Neil was the same way. He was really a supporter. Okay. And he was like, don't ever change for radio. Don't ever make a compromise. Do what you think's right and make any turn you feel like you have to do, whether it's going to be popular or unpopular. Who do you listen to? Is there are any uh, up-and-coming young, young singers that you listen to and you say, wow, you know, that kid's going to make it. That's, <laughs> that's a person I really like listening to. I think when I heard, heard Ed Sheeran's first record and first single, I was like, I really liked his writing. He struck me as more of a singer-songwriter. To me, there's a difference between people that write songs and singer-songwriters. Uh, both are kind of, you know, great. Right. Um, but to me, a singer-songwriter has to have a heart that cares about society and social issues and not just romantic issues or self-interest. Uh, and I heard that in his first record, and I think is, you know, the second record was really an amazing follow-up and uh, found a way to kind of make folk music very relevant. And yeah. uh, I just like his style a lot. I thought he was very good. I grew up listening to a lot of the classics and reading all the classics. So I was really a student of Sarah Vaughan singing and um, a lot of the great singers. I learned to imitate them until, you know, I sounded exactly like them mm -hmm. to learn vocal control and breath control and tone and color. And then I could start to make my own creations sort of once I really learned how to discipline my voice and teach myself to sing by listening to the best singers. And same with songwriting. I tended to gravitate toward the writers that were unapologetic mm -hmm. about their viewpoint. So Dolly Parton, Loretta Lynn, Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, um, a lot of punk rock acts uh, that were just... They were who they were. Paul Westerberg, you know, was just unapologetic. This is what I think, and this is who I am. Yeah. I was attracted to that kind of writing. Yeah. Now you, uh, you're just back from a tour with uh, the great Don Henley, mm -hmm. too. Now, uh, when you guys, you, oh, you opened mm -hmm. uh, for him. So did you have the opportunity? You didn't 
were, were you on stage together at all? I we didn't collaborate on stage didn't. at okay. all, um, but he did offer to write with me, which I was super excited about. So mm. I'll take him up on that. <laughs> yeah. And that that must be uh, pretty exhausting and and exciting too. Talk we were talking about mm. adrenaline before you playing huge arenas, yeah. right? Do you have a preference, the, the huge arena or the small coffee house setting? You know, I play solo acoustic almost exclusively now. Sometimes I take out a band. I'll be doing a Christmas tour this year with a band. Mm -hmm. um, but I like being alone on stage. It's very difficult. You have to read the audience. You can't get it wrong. You have to capture people's attention with nothing but your voice and your guitar and your yeah. wit, and it's difficult. And so opening for Dawn in these large venues, uh, it was a challenge. You know, there were days where I definitely had to, have to talk with myself and be like, all right, you haven't even fought the war yet. The war's not over. Get out there. And, you know, there's a chance of winning. And luckily the shows went really well. Um, but it is a, it's a fun challenge. I have to ask you, uh, I mean, you, the, just a diverse and incredible career. What we like to ask people since, you know, I get to spend 22 minutes with you. <laughs> who would you want to spend 22 minutes with? Gosh, there's lots of people. Um, I think the people that have always interested in me personally um, haven't been famous people. They've been just um, people that I've met that have I've been able to interview. I've always been a very curious person, you know. So driving across a ranch in Texas, looking at an, you know, a man in his 60s, looking at his ranch, and just asking him questions as we drove about his wife and his marriage and the choices that he made and. People will be incredibly honest with you if you ask them honest questions. It's pretty shocking, actually. And I think that's been some of the biggest honors of my life, is having people open up and share stories with me that you could never make up. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you can't even think this stuff up in your imagination. And people leave, lead extraordinary lives. And often it's people that live in the public eye that get asked a lot of questions. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of amazing, heroic people out there that don't get any spotlight, that uh, have lived extraordinary lives, made extraordinary mistakes, extraordinary comebacks. And I love those stories. Everybody's got a story. That's that, very that, true. <laughs> that is certainly true. Now, um, while you continue to do uh, movies for the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries Channel, um, will you? Are you still during? You know, maybe somebody else has a scene that you're not in. Are you? Are you scribbling out songs? Are you? Are you still always actively songwriting? I'm always writing melodies. Now that I'm a mom. It really isn't acting that's changed it, it's being a mom. I don't have those free hours, as you know. If you're working and being a mom, yeah. I don't exercise. I mean, like, you really get very little done. I haven't learned how yet, besides, you know, and he's not in school regularly, so I really try and spend my time with my son and then a few hours working, and then that's pretty much what I got. And so I catch melodies on my iPhone, I capture them. I can't honestly say I've gone back and revisited them. Um, I think I will. There'll be another phase where I start going to an album writing cycle again and I'll start to dig out those melodies. But everything comes to me from classical arias to, I like writing rap, <laughs> um, country songs, rock songs. I just, everything comes out That's, of me. There's I write a, a lot genre of you stories. haven't done, <laughs> rap. Can we expect a, a rap album from Jewel in the future? I have things in my future, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if, if you were to uh, release, do you think you will release another album in, yeah, in I'll the make near more future? Records. I don't know, you know if it'll be next year or the year after that, but I'll always make records. And yeah, I can never see that going away. I have a book of love poetry that's ready to come out. Um, and then this website that I've been building, this mindfulness platform, is starting to work with corporate culture to help people gain tone in every area of their life because we can't just be good at work or we can't just be parents. We have to have every limb of our life have tone. Otherwise, we're not happy. All right. Well, what a pleasure speaking thank with you. you today, Jewel. I have about 100 more questions, <laughs> Aww, but thank, thank you, so, you much so much for coming in. We really do appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, thank you. you.